welcome to the penultimate session of the um, summit. Um, and um, this session is called Better Together? Question um, mark. And as a Brit, of course, this now consumes <laughs> our every waking moment and some of the sleeping moments, too, as to whether it is indeed better to be together. Um, so to discuss this, we have um, three panelists. Um, Ernest Stetter in the middle, who I was with at a workshop yesterday, Secretary General of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies in Brussels. And on his left, um, geographically, I don't know whether that's political too, is Stephen Blockmans, who's the head of EU foreign policy at the Centre for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And uh, on my left um, is Dalibor Rohach, research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, um, which is one of the big Washington-based American, uh, I think I could call you quite rightly, free market conservative um, think tanks. Now, the idea of this um, uh, session is that um, each of uh, my um, panelists uh, were rapporteurs yesterday at um, uh, three separate sessions held in the afternoon. And um, we were each given, they were each given um, uh, subjects um, to uh, talk about. Um, and as many of you were probably there, you all contributed, I hope, um, ideas and thoughts to their um, uh, to discussions. And hopefully overnight, our, our panelists did their homework and they have distilled um, your um, disorganized musings and thoughts into sharply formed and um, coherent policy points. Um, which I'm now going to ask each of them to give we, uh, 10 minutes each at the beginning, uh, sort of to give their um, a resume of what those uh, thoughts, ideas, etc. are. Um, then I'm going to open it up to the um, audience um, for comments and suggestions. And I think the idea is then that um, the sum of all these parts then filters up um, to higher authorities and um, informs uh, the debate for the better um, about the future of Europe. So um, I'll ask you, let's um, start with you, I think, uh, Dalibor, since you're just on my left. Um, do you want to begin? And you should begin by asking, by telling people a little bit about the subject you were uh, discussing, of course, as well. Thank you. Um, I would say that our session was probably the most abstract and the hardest to pin down. It revolved around questions of identity, political allegiance, uh, around the conflict that seems to exist between national political identities and the emerging European political identity, if there is uh, indeed such a thing. The good news is that uh, faced with these highly abstract, uh, perhaps even somewhat vague questions, our group was able to provide crisp clear, decisive answers that will settle the debate for the next generation, at least. Um, on a slightly more serious note, uh, I think it's, it's good to begin with a, with a joke that's relevant to, uh, to, this, uh, to this discussion. Um, it's one that I actually overheard uh, yesterday, and I'm told it's a sort of running joke in, in, in the Czech Republic around uh, at, at this time. Um, it's, there's a journalist who is writing a story about uh, the popular attitudes uh, towards the European Union. And, and in order to get some quotes for the story, he goes to the Wenceslas Square here in Prague and, and he talks to the average Czech. And he asks the average Czech whether, uh, what, what was the biggest problem with uh, popular attitudes uh, towards, towards the EU, whether it's the lack of knowledge or lack of interest. And, and the average Czech looks back puzzled and says, well, I, I have no clue, but honestly, I couldn't care less. Um, and, and that, in a way, uh, summarizes part of the problem, uh, because the EU is indeed asked to make uh, political decisions. Um, at the same time, making political decisions uh, in a form of government that recognizes democracy requires a public that is interested and involved and recognizes the legitimacy of, 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 those, of, those, of those decisions. 
Um, and that, in turn, arguably requires a political sense of allegiance, a sense of collective we, as, as the British philosopher Roger Scruton put it, or, or a sense of moral like-mindedness, uh, to use the words of, of Frank Knight, a University of Chicago economist who wrote about this subject in the 1930s. So I suppose in some sense, the goal of our session yesterday was to answer the Eurosceptic challenge to the European project, which consists of arguing that because there is no European demos, there is no European political nation, there can therefore be no European democracy. As a result, many of the decisions that are being taken in Brussels ought to be returned to the level of nation states where there is indeed a political nationhood and a sense of, of political legitimacy. Um, there are various answers to, to this Eurosceptic charge, and one of them, perhaps the most compelling one, consists of saying that the notion of political nationhood of demos is, is a fluid one. It's not unique. And it's certainly not uh, exclusive. Um, to be more specific, uh, you know, one can be a Czech, one can be from Prague, one can be a European, and all three of these identities would come with different set of political allegiances. It's not clear that uh, one has to uh, come at the expense of the other. Indeed, you could argue that being a good Czech means also being a good European and vice versa. These identities could be mutually uh, mutually reinforcing rather than uh, in, in some form of inherent uh, conflict. Or to use a, an example from, from history, both American and, and, and European, uh, it is fairly straightforward just by revisiting uh, the experience of the past, say, 300 years to see that uh, our current political identities, uh, political nationhood that exists in various places in Europe and in America indeed, is a product of cultural evolution and change. And there's this chicken and egg question of what comes first, whether it's political institutions or political identities. And um, it is quite clear that at the time when the United States were being founded in late 18th century, there was no such thing as an American political identity. Indeed, way into, way into the post-bellum period, uh, most Americans thought of themselves primarily as citizens of Maryland, Virginia, and New York, etc. Only then they thought of themselves as, as Americans. Uh, but of course, this, is not, this question of political identity is not just of academic importance. Uh, there is a very urgent, as we know, practical side to it. Since 2008, we've seen across Europe a rise of populism and nationalism that tries to argue uh, that national identity ought to trump, and pun is intended here, uh, European uh, identity. And that results uh, in a every nation for itself mentality, which seems to be more and more pervasive on the continent. I think we'll get a flavor of that on the following panel, uh, featuring some of the, uh, the Visegrad uh, prime ministers. So our discussion yesterday focused essentially on two things. It first focused on the roots of this nationalist backlash against the emergence of, of a European identity. And there are various explanations that one can provide, obviously, because social phenomena are complex and we rarely get the opportunity to run a controlled experiment of, 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 of any meaningful kind, especially when it comes to questions that are hard to pin down, hard to translate into measurable terms, one could offer a multitude of different accounts of what has happened to European identity in the past couple of years. One could see the current developments, the rise of nationalism as, as a result of a backlash against globalization more broadly, as a result of the uncertainty that comes with a highly complex, globalized, open society. One could see it as an immediate reaction to uh, the financial crises that hit first uh, America and later, and, and, and later Europe. One could see it as a mere reflection of domestic grievances that are being projected on these distant, uh, unintelligible uh, international institutions, in many cases perhaps unfairly. One could also see it as a reflection of petty uh, nativism and, 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 and some of the less savory beliefs that perhaps uh, some of our fellow citizens harbor. I don't think we can decisively answer 
the question of what uh, or who is the culprit in, 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 in this context. And then our discussion as a result of that shifted towards the question of what can be uh, done to counter this reassertion of nationalist narratives. And there has been in our debate, I believe, a tension between two broad approaches. The first one uh, started from the recognition that uh, the proponents of the European project need to speak both to the mind and to the heart. Uh, you can't really win emotional arguments, arguments that are uh, organized around questions of identity, allegiance, and, 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 and an emotional attachment to a place or a collective uh, a group of people. You can't can win those arguments with statistics and, 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 and just pure, pure rationality. At the same time, uh, I think most of us converge towards, towards an understanding that uh, the sense of allegiance, belonging, uh, or political legitimacy, if you will, I think these are, these are sides of, of the same coin, essentially, can't be constructed from the top. It can't be something that European elites built and then, then helicopter over, over, uh, over the European, European public. Uh, and I think that leads to humility in some sense. And uh, one, one thing that resonated is that perhaps the best way to change people's minds is not to try to invent some radically new narratives about the European project, about European integration, about the EU, but rather to patiently but firmly uh, show people, show, not tell, uh, that the EU is indeed an engine of prosperity, one of the elements that guarantee uh, peace on the European continent and democracy, and indeed harmony between European nations. And, uh, and that's something that we should not take for granted, that's something we should not assume. There are people who actually uh, take different view on, on, on these subjects, and, and the burden of proof uh, eventually, ultimately, is, is, is on, on, on the European, European elites. Uh, the burden of proof is, is, is on those who argue for, uh, for, for more uh, and, and, and tighter, uh, tighter Europe. And, and, and those have to really engage um, you know, the Eurosceptics or the nationalists or the populists on, 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 on their own grounds and do that uh, perhaps even with some, some degree of Empathy. As for myself, I think I've done my part. I, 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 I recently published a book that's called Towards an Imperfect Union that makes a conservative case for the EU. And, and I would very much encourage you to, to, to follow my example and, and talk to uh, the Eurosceptic, the nationalist in, in your neighborhood and try to, uh, try to change their mind. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. For, you, got a, you got a book plug in there. To you. Indeed. <laughs> very good. Um, Thank you very much. Go on to um, Ernst. Ten, ten minutes on okay. our workshop. Thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Richard. Well, let, let me perhaps start with a, with a little tale. I'm not starting with a joke. I was invited last mm -hmm. uh, week in Helsinki to give a conference on uh, what is the new narrative, economic narrative in, uh, in Europe to be developed. And this is exactly also the topic we have discussed yesterday. And then looking a bit at the literature and so I I got uh, advised uh, looking at the Moomin's tales. And I don't know if you know this, this is very popular in the Nordic countries, and there is a figure called Snafkinin, and uh, Snafkin is asking his papa, who is Moomin papa, what is happening in the world? And Moomin papa is answering, fuss and misery. <laughs> and then the story goes on, and then finally, at the end of the story, Moomin papa uh, is saying, but uh, Snafkin, you have to be very uh, uh, also positive in a way. All things are so very uncertain. And that exactly what makes me feel reassured. So I think this is a, a very positive message on also in the sense when we are talking on the European Union and the things uh, in a way how it can be better and how we can go forward in uh, this uh, unprecedented uh, project started after the Second World War. And uh, we, are talking, we were talking yesterday, in a sense, how we translate growth to social cohesion. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, this was the beginning of the European Union uh, when it was founded in the, in the 50s and it was thought that economic growth can bring social cohesion. And that's why also we discussed yesterday that one of the preconditions that we go back to cohesion within the European Union and also that what you said we tackle nationalism is the social cohesion uh, in the European Union. So we have to re-establish growth. A growth in a way that can bring us employment and can bring down what is unacceptable in the European Union, that we have countries in the south where we have more than 50% of the young people not finding a job. This is the challenge we have to fulfill with policies and with politics uh, in the European Union. This is also what we discussed yesterday, and the discussion was, in a sense, going very quickly in which way, and I think this is the need also, in which way we as European citizens, we as those who are also in Brussels and in the national member states responsible for policies, can tackle this question of rising employment and giving a chance to the younger generation to be as our generation was and the generation of our fathers was better off. This was always the promise. This was the promise of the European Union after the disaster of the Second World War and uh, this was the promise also when the common market was created and this was the promise when we talked in the 90s of this European social model. It was a, the European social model was a reference all over the world and it was quoted and unfortunately, this was the debate also we had yesterday, in the moment when the crisis in 2007, 2008 started, it was totally threatened. And here we are today, we have still not solved it. So we need to think of positive labor market reforms, not labor market reforms that when a politician is talking on that, population is just thinking, well, they are talking on reforms, they are talking on cuts, they are talking on austerity. No, we have to find in modern language or in the Brussels language we talk on a narrative, we have to find something that reform is seen as something which is giving hope, which is giving promise, and which is also promising real results. Uh, youth unemployment and unemployment, which is higher than 10% all over the European Union, is in the long run not positive and not good for the 500 million citizens of the European Union. In that way, the dream we had for the European Union is under attack. When we are talking on that, uh, we have also to think that the expectations we have um, in a way when we are doing all these politics of the European semester, of the multi-annual financial framework, of the questioning uh, in which we have the fiscal compact uh, uh, realized, should have first and foremost the ideal to look that we can do something for the employment, firstly. The second point I would like uh, to mention is that employment has also something to do, especially for young people, and this was a, a long dispute and a long debate in our session yesterday, uh, with education. And education is a, a precondition also that you can fulfill the demand of the labor markets, especially for young people. And we discussed, for example, that in some countries, uh, eventually we have to analyze that the educational system is not giving the right response to that what is needed on the labor market. Which does not mean, and this was uh, one point also in the debate, 
that we have just to, to think always only in the way that we need to produce uh, a good uh, a young people who are capable to have immediately their job and that's why we need technicians and we need a, a kind of those which is the demand of the labor market. No, we have to look for systems which bring all together apprentices uh, on, the, on the level of those who are working in the fields of manufacturing, the engineering, but also the science and, and and all the levels in, in the society. If you produce, in a sense, in brackets, only uh, people, let's say it a bit bluntly, because I think we can discuss this also, which are political scientists, I think this is not responding to that what this labor market are uh, uh, asking for. Um, well, in a sense, the, the, the last point I would like to make, and it will be very short, is uh, European Union, and this was also what you said, is not finished yet. And we don't have, um, especially what is the social cohesion, what is perhaps, or what can perhaps be called a consistent trinity in the European Union. We have a union which is not finalized in the political sense. We have a union which is not finalized in the monetary and the fiscal sense. And we have also a union which is not finalized in the monetary and uh, in, the, in the economic and the social, uh, uh, on the social issues. And to find this kind of, of circle of a trinity, which is the normal way how states are functioning and should function, we need to work on that very clearly. Means that for growth, means for social cohesions, we have to look for another way to do economic policies. And uh, there was, uh, there was one, one tweet here I was, I was saying, well, when we talk on that to fulfill social cohesion, we have to look at this also in, in a connection to the fiscal and monetary union. And there is a lot of debate at the moment also on the, on the reform of the euro and on the reform of the monetary system and also in the way of the fiscal, a fiscal union should be, should be started. But please, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a question just to say we all pay money to Brussels. Brussels is a, a getting together of all the member states and Brussels is not just uh, 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 eating the money and it's not, it's not brought back. For sure not, it's all functioning. And uh, taxes are, uh, for a lot of people, not very nice to pay. But on the other side, every state and every kind of union and every kind of political body has have to have the right to raise taxes in order to fill fulfill the obligations. Is it on the economic field? Is it also on the security issue? Is it on the interior issue? So we need the money in a sense and European Union at the moment has no fiscal capacity and in that sense it cannot also develop further schemes for example like uh, to discuss uh, an overall unemployment scheme which can perhaps then um, solve some of the problems we are discussing also with regards uh, to that what is happening in, uh, in a fortnight uh, uh, concerning the EU, the EU referendum. There was a quick um, idea or debate which I brought in and we discussed, uh, uh, which is also gaining a lot of uh, momentum at the moment within the intellectual debate uh, and which had uh, this last Sunday uh, in Switzerland even a referendum. This is the question of a basic income in a sense to discuss it perhaps a bit more deeper, to give um, a way that we uh, tackle sometimes uh, heavy administration, that we look uh, that to give to each and everybody a standard of a minimum within the European Union, and this can eventually help also to create a better cohesion. In that way, first of all, Precondition is economic growth. Secondly, we have to uh, tackle clearly the question of the employment. And thirdly, working for realizing the consistent trinity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ernst. Um, Stefan. Thank you. Um, I will take my role as rapporteur 
quite seriously. I'm not suggesting, by the way, Ooh. that you have not done so, but <laughs> I will stick quite closely <laughs> to, um, to the discussion we, we've had, which was, to my mind, quite sobering. Um, coming uh, in the wake of you know, Russia's aggressive foreign policy towards its uh, neighbors, in the wake of the terrorist attacks in Paris and in Brussels, exiting the Brussels bubble and coming to Prague and having a discussion with people from all over Europe was indeed a sobering experience uh, for someone who has perhaps more Euro-federalist um, ideas. And that is exactly why I want to stay quite closely to the role that has been attributed uh, to me. Uh, indeed, the discussion started with an open, perhaps cynical question. Um, are we really that insecure? Um, or is this, is this feeling rather the result of uh, a media hype? Uh, the question was not further tackled, uh, by the way, I should immediately uh, state. Rather uh, diverted um, to the understanding that we need to cooperate in the security field, both internally, homeland security, as well as external uh, security, and that we can do so. Um, within the European Union, uh, albeit perhaps not by using the full-fledged uh, method that, uh, that applies to other areas, because indeed we're dealing here with the last bastions of sovereignty, state sovereignty. Member states um, essentially do not want to uh, transfer competences uh, as they do in other fields towards the European Union, or if so, only limited and uh, they may not have the, de the democratic mandate, uh, legitimacy, you know, to, to outsource those uh, security uh, aspects to the European Union. Um, we discussed in the first half of the, of the workshop, which you know, was, was really quite hands-on and we huddled together in, in a circle uh, of, of chairs, um, we first tackled the homeland security issue and then later on the, the external uh, security aspects. As far as internal uh, security is concerned, uh, the starting point was really the EU's uh, anti-terrorist uh, strategy, which is all about building resilience, um, the ability to react and to cooperate uh, ex post crisis response, therefore, not so much prevention, simply because the lack of trust in, for example, intelligence sharing hampers such conflict uh, prevention, or rather crisis prevention, it seems, at the European uh, level. Um, in that sense, you know, discussions about the creation of a European CIA or a European FBI are far-fetched. It was a general feeling. Um, that, these, uh, that these institutions will not emerge uh, very quickly at all, um, and uh, that this has to do with uh, this lack of trust that, uh, that was mentioned before. Of course, a lot of cooperation happens on a bilateral, trilateral uh, basis. Intelligence is shared, especially if there is this feeling of trust that this information will not be leaked to the wrong parties. Um, so. It is the, the minilateral type of cooperation which seems to, uh, to be the, the way forward here, whereas the role of the EU is really one of a supporting, supporting actor um, to, uh, to structure perhaps crisis response, um, to, to put in place some early warning uh, mechanisms, to, uh, to allow for lessons learned to be drawn and, and, and shared between member states, uh, training through uh, to Europol, uh, but as far as the root causes are concerned, for example, uh, religious or ethnic radicalization uh, within member states, it, it was truly felt that this is a member state issue uh, where the competence really lies and will continue to lie in the nearby uh, future. As far as military responses to attacks on the homeland is concerned, territorial defense, um, Article 42, paragraph 7, the Mutual Defence Clause uh, or Assistance Clause, which is included in the EU treaty, has been invoked once by France in the wake of the Paris attacks. And we heard uh, from a representative of a think tank in, uh, in Paris that the feeling in Paris is really that this has worked, that this level of solidarity has been displayed by other member states, even if 
the delivery of means and methods and instruments has been scattered, um, also in a geographical uh, sense. Um, of course, an intergovernmental method has dominated um, the, uh, the way of pooling and sharing such resources by other member states, bypassing the, uh, the EU institutions. And it was a general feeling in the group that this is supposed to be the way to do it. These are member state competences and they should pre probably uh, remain at the national level. Plus, there is NATO. Uh, the ultimate guarant guarantor in a military sense of, uh, of territorial uh, defense. Uh, the EU could perhaps, uh, below the threshold of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, offer civilian methods in complementarity, but not much more. The EU would probably need a plan uh, in terms, again, of early warning and training, but not much more. And so, the emphasis really shifted as far as the external um, security aspect is concerned to CSDP, the Common Security and Defence Policy of the European Union, being used for uh, expeditionary uh, means, uh, especially in a civilian nature, to a more limited extent also in a military uh, nature. Um, but uh, here there was a realisation that member states often do not display the political willingness to provide the necessary troop and kit uh, for CSDP missions, whether they are of a peacekeeping nature or, uh, or a humanitarian nature or, uh, or indeed a rule of law uh, or security sector reform uh, nature. And that is the problem. In a military sense, most emblematically shown by the fact that the battle group mechanism which has readily available uh, force packages of a number of member states to, uh, cooperating together available, that this mechanism has not been triggered yet. And still, or perhaps therefore, it seems that the gap between the ambitions of Euro-Federalists which claim for a European Defence Union and some ministries in member states, most, uh, most particularly uh, Germany, working in that direction on aspects, it seems of, of greater uh, defense planning um, and, and structuring, that rea the splintered reality between member states uh, prevails. Um, member states who have different avenues to use, uh, different international organizations to choose from if they want to uh, engage in such expeditionary action. And so the objectives for the CSDP in that sense uh, should perhaps be scaled down a little bit, was the observation in the group, and should be restrained to the lower end of uh, the spectrum in terms of intensity, based on coalitions of able and willing, mostly ad hoc, um, some uh, more permanently structured. But the minilateral way was the way forward uh, it was felt. And there is plenty of evidence already of such bilateral, trilateral, plurilateral cooperation in the military field. A number of member states seem to return in such contexts. Germany has cooperation with Poland, uh, Germany has cooperation with, uh, with the Netherlands, the Netherlands has cooperation with Belgium. So th th there, there is a cluster of member states that seems to uh, to embrace this multilateral uh, method of, of cooperation. And that is perhaps um, yeah, the, the, the core of member states that could be built upon um, in, in a more structured context as well, especially in the build-up of military capabilities. Um, it was the, uh, the feeling. Um, here, the European Defence Agency was mentioned, um, which of course has a couple of pet projects, um, but where the more um, important and bigger member states, militarily stronger member states, choose in fact to procure and develop new technologies in the military sphere outside of the EDA context, uh, where they can control that development uh, more. The development of a European drone, for example, was, uh, was mentioned in this respect. Still, the feeling was in the group that uh, spending better together, buying together uh, is, uh, is the way forward and that to that end the procurement cycles in uh, member states should be synchronized uh, better. Um, 
to, to wrap up, perhaps, the conclusion, uh, as I, uh, I, should, I should have become clear by now, is, is really, yes, we are better together in order to face the security threats that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we have. Um, but the way forward and how to do that is probably still more uh, in a mini-lateral and mostly ad hoc uh, manner. Note, by the way, that this rather sobering conclusion uh, for European cooperation and integration in the military uh, as well as homeland security uh, spheres um, was distinctly different in the ensuing Oxford-style debate on whether or not there should be a European army. We had two polls there, before and after um, a lengthy debate uh, between um, uh, the, the speakers and, uh, and the audience, and the polls were consistent in uh, a six to four division. 60% of uh, those um, voting uh, via the Slido app um, in favor of transferring more sovereignty towards a future uh, European army. Now, that begs the question um, to what extent, you know, the composition of the, uh, the group in the workshop and, um, and of course, the people polling uh, here in the room on the uh, Oxford-style debate, whether that is truly uh, representative um, uh, since we have such, you know, diverging outcomes. Thank you very much, Stefan. Now, before going um, to the audience, I wanted to ask each of you, t taking uh, my cue from you, uh, since this session is better together, question mark, I wanted to uh, he um, ask each of you, did you hear anything in your sessions um, that basically challenged the concept of, of, of better together? Was there anything on any issues, any voices? that um, you picked out um, that challenges that, that basic consensus. I see we've already got one question here, anonymous, better together, for instance, what's the voice of young people? And certainly at our panel yesterday, we spent about half the time actually probably dwelling on, you know, high youth unemployment, lack of opportunities, lack of jobs, etc., etc., which seemed to me to be a very fundamental challenge to what the European Union can currently um, offer. So, uh, Danibor, maybe you'd like to, to, to start. So it was, it was FD's Henry Foy, who, who is in the room, indeed, uh, who tweeted yesterday that it was a great idea for the organizers to have entitled this conference Better Together. It was a bad idea not to have actually brought into yeah. the room people from, 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 from the other side of the debate. That was, to some extent, felt in at, 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 at my session. There was, at times, too much agreement in a way, and, and if there were divergences, they were on relatively modest, uh, modest uh, issues. I, th I think we have a duty, in a way, to, to go out and to talk to people who disagree with us, to go to places where we are, uh, where we are uh, not invited, and, 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 and this is, in many ways, a terrific conference, um, and perhaps this would not be the best time and place to, to do that sort of outreach, but, but somebody needs to do it at some yeah. point, both at an intellectual level and also at a, at a, at a political level. Um, if you want me to say something on the young people. Yes, you know. Um, yeah. I think it's a mixed bag. It differs from, from country to country. In the uh, Brexit discussion, um, it looks like most of the young people are, are converging towards, uh, towards Remain. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's a universal pattern across Europe. In Hungary, uh, Jobbik, the far-right quasi-neo-Nazi group, uh, is the party, political party of choice for young people, particularly for, uh, for university students. Um, and, and therefore, I don't think we should take it for granted that the young generation of people who have no historical recollection of the great wars of the 20th century and who is used to a life in an integrated and open free Europe uh, is somehow immune from the temptations of nationalism, nativism, uh, and so on and so forth. Thanks. And yeah. Uh, I said it, I think, also when we discussed it yesterday, uh, reinstalling, re 
installing economic growth and social cohesion brings us automatically to a situation that we feel better together because this gives us jobs, this gives us growth, this gives us security uh, for the lives. If you have a lifetime circle, you, you would like to have a good education, you would like to have a good job, and you would like also to have a, a fine retirement. And this has to be assured by our societies and our politicians. And the European Union, in that sense, uh, should, should help uh, uh, for us. We have done at, at FAPS, at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, in the last one and a half years, um, uh, polls and surveys all over Europe, but also worldwide on the millennial dialogue, on the millennial generation. And we have asked more than 20,000 young people uh, all over the world, but uh, more than 16,000 in the European Union. And I really agree with what you said, uh, which, which turns out. The point is that the young generation is not apathic, apathic towards politics or so. And they are very much engaged in, in, in the way how they see politics. Lots of them would like to be much more uh, listened and much more brought in uh, in, in, the, in the political finding and in the political discussions and a clear uh, a message from that polls for us is that we have to restore the confidence of young people towards our political system and we have to think in which way we should do this also within the system of our representative democracy and the European Union has also to show that this what happened in the last elections, for example, that there was in the last European elections, there was this question to have a choice between the so-called Spitzenkandidaten in Germany, that this is not set now by the European Council because they fear that perhaps uh, this will lower their kind of political influence. Because this was a way to give a choice to the people what is a political orientation within the European Union also. And uh, in that way also that the European Parliament, which is the representative body uh, and democratic body of the European Commission, can decide who will be the Commission President. Um, for sure it's frightening. Uh, and we have to be better together. It's frightening that uh, in uh, Hungary, it's also our polls is showing this, more than two-thirds of the young people are in favor of uh, nationalist and right-wing uh, uh, parties. It's also frightening that uh, in uh, Western Europe, in France, for example, lots of people would like uh, to vote in the next presidential elections uh, for the Front National. Mm. This is a challenge. This is the mm. challenge we have to fight. Uh, and we have to overcome in order to be better together in Europe. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, it sounds as like your, your workshop um, concluded um, better apart, or, or at least that each country should um, be free to choose its own alliances and its own dimensions in terms of defence. So that sounded pretty Eurosceptic to me. Indeed, and uh, I should stress that this was an intergenerational debate yeah. where especially uh, the younger members of the group seem to uh, to favor the line that you just uh, 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 described. Um, more minilateralism, as I said. In fact, I mean, there was even an outlier perhaps in our, in our debate. You asked for, uh, for that in, in your first question. Uh, th there was a young representative from the Communist Party, I think in South Bohemia, maybe South Moravia, I don't know, mm. who, uh, who questioned the value of new draft EU legislation on the spread of small arms and light weapons, mm. uh, or an EU ban on the oh, personal yeah. ownership of, uh, uh, of guns, uh, and questioned whether that was a wise uh, move in the face of uh, the defense which was necessary uh, at a local level against uh, terrorist threats. I wouldn't suggest that this was representative mm -hmm. for uh, the rest of the, the, the debate, but it does characterize um, a, a more you know, Eurosceptic uh, attitude um, more generally in our, in our workshop towards mm -hmm. uh, a common foreign security and defense uh, policy through the EU. Okay, thank you, Sam. So I'm now going to open it up to the audience. I'm going to take some questions, comments, contributions from the floor first, maybe in bundles of, of one or two. Um, if you want to address a, a, a question or comment, observation to one particular panelist, 
um, please say so. So if you put your hand up so I can see you clearly, that would be useful. And there are some microphones um, going around, um, one at the back um, there. So or if any of the people in the workshops yesterday want to ca come back on any of the conclusions um, that you've just heard, uh, that may be um, interesting too. So is um, anyone um, want to contribute? Or yes, one gentleman at the back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, I just said this is more of a vague s statement that I'd like to maybe hear some reaction to. There was two comments up there on the, uh, on the board. Uh, one was pointing out that actually in Hungary, um, um, it was arguing that Jabik is not popular because of its anti-EU sentiment, that basically young people in Hungary are very interested in working outside of Hungary in the EU. And there was also a mention of this uh, Pew Center poll that I think came out, to, I only saw it this morning. Um, and it was actually the two most, you know, it ranked countries by how, um, how receptive they were to the European Union, right? Uh, pu uh, public opinion poll. So the, the most popular, the European Union was most popular in Poland, number one, Hungary, number two. Uh, so completely sort of contradictory to this narrative of, you know, populist, anti-European sentiment, I think in Central Europe specifically, and probably the two flagship uh, places that people are most concerned about uh, attitude towards the European, beyond, beyond Britain, I suppose. Um, I wonder if anyone on the panel has a reaction to that or, or how that fits into, uh, if th those numbers certainly surprise me, how that fits into the larger picture of what we're talking about up here today. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, any other contributions or thoughts for a moment? Um, Okay, well, do you want to just think? Yes, that was very interesting, wasn't it, and the Pew poll, because I, I suspect that's probably reversed, for instance, the problem of Brexit, is that most older people in Britain are against the EU, will vote out. Um, young people, they may um, <coughs> be more in favour of the EU, but as we discussed yesterday, they're less engaged politically and may well not vote, which is a big problem for the Remain campaign in Britain. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I suppose one thing that comes out from uh, opinion polls of, of, of millennials, uh, especially in America, I'm less sure about uh, the European context, but, but one thing that comes out quite consistently is that uh, political preferences of millennials are notoriously um, inconsistent and contradictory. That, that, that as, a, as a political group, unlike other groups of voters, millennials tend to want different things at the same time. They want less government and more government, mm -hmm. uh, more spending, uh, less taxation, etc., etc. And, and, and I suppose that that might be feeding into uh, some of what we are seeing even in Central Europe. So um, I don't have rigorous evidence for that, but there was a poll conducted in Slovakia prior to the um, uh, March election among uh, high school students asking them for, uh, asking about their political preferences, if they were allowed to vote, whom would they be voting for. Uh, the top two parties uh, that came up in that poll were, were the Slovak neo-Nazi party that ultimately made it to the parliament and, and, and another populist grouping that was just formed six months before before the election. That is not to say that nobody would suggest that that shows that Slovak teenagers are neo-Nazis or, or completely uh, sort of sold on, on, on anti-EU uh, nationalist rhetoric. I think it shows a certain degree of, 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 of confusion and perhaps a failure of educational institutions, especially in the, in the Central European context. Uh, but to, to go back to, to Ben's point, I think there is something to be said about uh, the EU's lack of salience as, as, uh, as an element of public opinion. Um, so the long research on uh, Euroscepticism in, in, in Europe shows that uh, the opposition to the EU is essentially used as a vehicle to project all sorts of domestic grievances for, for, for voters. I mean, if you look at sort of the, the time series of, of, of electoral results of, 
of, of, of UKIP, for example, uh, very rarely is there an actual EU-related policy issue that mobilizes the electorate. It's more often uh, just sheer anger, disenchantment of the political class that somehow gets translated through, I suppose, political entrepreneurship of people such as Nigel Farage into, into an anti, anti-EU argument. So I think in that light, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would try to reconcile the paradox that you see in Hungary and, and Poland, um, the seeming divergence between public opinion and, 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 and the line taken by their respective governments. Mm. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we have to eventually think and overcome one point, which is we are always seeing the EU we are always seeing this Brussels. We are always putting, let's say, bad things to that kind of, of uh, body in, 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 in Brussels. Now, the European Union is all of us. And what is so wrong with that European Union, in a sense? We have to find a, a better way to explain that is uh, something should be realized, in a sense, together on the European continent. And in that sense, I see also young people a bit and this is uh, the poll also of our Millennial Dialogue is showing this. Um, this, this way of how Europe is seen or how this kind of union of European citizens is seen, on the one hand, on the other hand, how politics and how policy, policies are seen to be done for young people. And the most uh, frightening and the most, uh, um, let's say, exciting, I will say exciting result of the poll we have done is that in all the countries, the top of the top priorities of young people, which they are asking the politicians, is not what you expect, education, this is the second, but the first is health care. I was surprised when I got all the results, and I can show you, and it's already published on, uh, on our website. It's health care. What does this mean for us? I think this means something that we should care on what is the procurement of public goods in our societies? That eventually there has to be, uh, there has happened something in the last 20 years that a lot of that, what was a common sense, what was this European social model saying that there is a procurement of public goods, this is threatened at the moment. And young people feel that also the European Union is not having an answer for them that they can be sure if their parents, if they have problems of health, this is treated in a way that they can continue their normal lives. This is something I think which is not acceptable also in our wealthy societies we are living so far. Thank you, Stefan. You want to come back uh, I'm, on that? I'm not sure whether from the, the viewpoint of security, both homeland well, and generally uh, external. Or, and, yeah. But, yeah, but I mean, it is, it is a point. I mean, what, what motivates um, people who are taking the poll um, to, you know, choose either option uh, that they're offered? Um, they have very different backgrounds. Uh, they have very different concerns. Mm -hmm. Their outlook on, um, on their own country and the position of that, their own country in the European Union or the world may be, may be very different. Mm -hmm. And um, so I find it I find it very hard, you know, to distill any any serious lessons from mm. you know questions which are framed in a very generic uh, manner. Mm. And yeah, the difference is, you know, um, from country to country may have to do indeed with you know the um, uh, with, with the satisfaction of people. Uh, polled mm. with the performance of their government or their level of government, mm. national or EU, in that particular segment. So, frankly, I, I don't have a straight answer for you. Okay. Yes, very quickly, yes, because yes, I'm just going to go to that, some uh, more audiences. I, I may also uh, ask you something on that issue, because it's, it's also of, of interest for myself, but also I think for, for all of you. You were saying when you're reporting on, on homeland security, uh, and, and this eternal questions of competence and who is competent also in, 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 in the fight against terrorism and, and, and so on. This has all to do remain on the member state level. Uh, is there not also here as something of a better together to bind forces and to do much more on that and to overcome this kind of uh, uh, fear that uh, also amongst the 
security uh, persons or so, that it's much better to go together because those who are fighting against our societies, the terrorists, they don't care on national sovereignties and so on. They don't care on national boundaries. They do their job, uh, their cruel job. And uh, uh, we uh, had the recent attacks in Brussels and uh, uh, one can say, well, they were not, well, they were perhaps born in, in, in Brussels, but they don't care if they are Belgians. Mm. Well, I think the, the answer that was given in the, in the expert group, which convened in a workshop yesterday was very much, uh, one uh, driven by a sense of reality that uh, the European Union could offer a common framework, uh, a 24-7 crisis uh, situation room, uh, coordination mechanisms, you know, to share information much more quickly, ex post, as I mentioned, crisis response, uh, rather than before, simply because the level of trust between mm. uh, in professional communities in uh, the intelligence uh, sector is not such uh, that any, you know, um, expanded form or supranational uh, form of governance in this field um, would be reasonable to expect anytime soon in the conflict prevention sphere. Yeah. Okay. Um, some more thoughts and questions. Yeah, there was one. Uh, well, we'll go there to, f to start in the middle there. First one. If you got the microphone there. And then we'll come to you. Thank you. I'll just, oh, I'll just actually, I'll starting with the gentleman there, then we'll come to you in the front, yeah? Okay. Right. It seems to me that one big underlying problem um, is that we have had an erosion of trust in Europe. This happens both at the level of governments, but also between the different populations of Europe. It started with the Euro crisis and it has got worse with the migration crisis. What can we do in order to restore confidence and trust in each other that will then permit us to solve all these practical issues that we've been discussing these days? Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Yes. And in the front here. Uh, yes. Alt Sosnes from Latvian Institute of International Affairs. My question goes in the same direction, actually, because we, we have heard from high-standing um, speakers uh, during this conference that it's essential to stay together, but they also stress the necessity for voluntarism so that decisions are not imposed on the member states and have then to balance between obligations arising from or which are so, so pertinent for staying together and this, this will for voluntarism. Um, thank you. Um, any more thoughts and contributions for now? Can yes, I? woman in the front there. Yes, I would like to, to, to say just uh, one word concerning the young generation, mm -hmm. uh, terrorism and uh, and uh, the, the kind of lost generation feeling among part of the young societies, which can also breed, as a side effect, uh, something uh, well, like uh, and terrorism, even the so-called Islamist terrorism, even though the people in, in Europe, I must say, in Europe, uh, even though the people uh, are not Muslims at the beginning, and they, they convert to be able to, to, to be in, those, uh, in that uh, terrorist movements. And uh, I would say that, of course, uh, there is some kind of fear, some kind of insecurity which breeds this. We don't know what it is exactly. It's very difficult to find. But uh, there is something which, which is maybe to some extent similar and, and a feeling of um, getting involved in some way, uh, be important and, and bring some, uh, something to the society in a very pervert way. But it is also something that maybe, uh, I have a feeling that some of those people would have been in red brigades 20 years ago. It's not, uh, we shouldn't think about the Islamist threat only in the framework of Islam and Islamist movements. Um, thank you. That's a very interesting um, point. Inheritors, any more for now before I go back? Yes, gentleman there at the mid right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Hello. I consider myself young. I was born in 1989. And I, and I have a question because I also um, don't feel attached to a traditional party. Uh, well, party politics, so to speak. And when I look at my circle of friends, they are even doing worse. Um, so shouldn't we 
uh, start by um, talking about national politics rather than EU politics. Shouldn't we um, lower or higher the threshold of political parties in order to regain trust of the younger people? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let's take some of those questions. I mean, can I link the first one and the second one together briefly? Um, trust, uh, clearly very important, very good point about you know, the erosion of trust um, with uh, the financial crisis and then the immigration crisis that uh, many people feel that the um, EU, the EU um, leadership is not up to the job, that it hasn't got the capacity uh, or the competence to steer the EU through these various crises and um, you know and this constant tension between dealing with issues at the EU level and the national level at the national um, political level the party political level this is all an argument uh, as, you, as you well know that party national politics sh should be uh, elevated at the expense of some of the powers accruing in Brussels do you, do you want to tackle those that sort of linked themes if I can and then we'll come to Oh, the other questions? What, what uh, I suppose that, on that? There, there are a few different things going on. Yeah. One source of a more or less constant frustration with the European project is the uh, mismatch between the ambitions and the mm. tools available to, to pursue those ambitions, both in terms of uh, technical ability to carry out decisions, but also the sense of, of political legitimacy and, 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 and the connection with uh, with, 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 with the general public. Um, in terms of uh, the erosion of trust that we have seen in recent years related to the Eurozone crisis and, 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 and to the refugee crisis, which have really divided Europe into different segments, the you know, creditor nations with, uh, 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 are sort of uh, you know, in a perpetual state of conflict with the, with the nations of debtors, uh, and also on the refugee front, you see a division emerging between new and old Europe, in a sense, or between uh, Germany and Sweden on the one hand, on the one side, and, and everybody else on, 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 on the other side. Uh, and the reason for that, in my opinion, to some extent, has to do with a lack of political leadership at the national level. Um, the recognition that we live in a world of second, third, fourth best, that any solution that's arrived at in Brussels is going to be imperfect, is going to be a compromise, will never satisfy everybody perfectly, and yet we need leaders to essentially own those decisions and to sell them to, the, to their respective constituencies at home. Very often politicians uh, shy away from, 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 from that duty, and I think that's, that's part of the uh, that's part of the uh, part of the uh, the problem we are living in. Uh, with regard to the last question, uh, very very briefly, uh, I agree that there has to be uh, also a recognition that goes back actually between to, to the um, to this question of divergence between ambitions and tools. Uh, we've heard a lot about what the EU should be doing: promoting growth, uh, building a common security, and uh, and defense policy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and these are all worthwhile goals, and many of them should indeed be pursued at the European level. Uh, at the same time, if you look at, for example, the question of economic growth, and you look at uh, the enormous differences that exist between European countries in terms of the quality of the business environment, uh, regulation, et cetera, uh, I think it's fairly easy to realize that uh, many of the biggest obstacles to economic growth are uh, self-inflicted. They, they are not due to a lack of big EU-wide solutions, but they are due to the failure of domestic policies, whether it's Greece um, or even, even the United Kingdom. Uh, my Eurosceptic friends say that, oh, by leaving the EU, we'll liberate ourselves from the shackles of European regulation. Yet, the biggest hurdles to, to, to UK's economic growth have to do with uh, urban planning policies, with a patchy educational system, uh, with things that can be, indeed, should be reformed yeah. domestically without asking for, for anybody's permission in Brussels. And I think the only way for Greece out of its current problem uh, is through domestic ownership and leadership of, of economic reforms. Greece is not the first country in the world that's suffering from, uh, from a debt overhang and, and from 
from a massively over-regulated labor market and unsustainable uh, state of public finances. Thanks, uh, Ernst. Yeah. Um, well, I think this question with trust uh, and, and competence has a lot to do together and uh, uh, was also asked a bit what is the consequences of this uh, problem of economic growth and this problem of uh, not having any more social coherence and cohesions within the European Union. And I think we have to remind ourselves mm. also a bit how others in the world have handled and tackled the economic mm. crisis when it started mm. in 2007 to 8. I will not elude uh, all of, of US politics and policies, uh, but there was a clear difference in the way how the US tackled the crisis and how the European Union behaved when the crisis uh, started. Uh, the US immediately launched a stimulus program of more than $750 billion, uh, if I remember well the figure. And uh, believe me, the, the statistics are showing that all this money, all this money is now paid back to the federal state. Point. That means they took money in their hands, they stimulated the economy, and they are now at the moment that they have the lowest unemployment rate ever. Uh, last month it was 5%, it was even below 5%, 4.9%, and as an economist I can say this is full employment. So what has the European Union done? There were very good proposals of the uh, former uh, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown also. Uh, uh, there was this famous G7 summit uh, mm -hmm. uh, at, at that time. Uh, they were, it was also asked to do a real stimulus towards uh, the European economies. The stimulus was about uh, 70, 70 uh, uh, billion, I, if, if I remember this well, 70 in to 750, yeah. this is a large, a large difference. And uh, even nowadays, there is still money left on that stimulus. So this is also a question of bringing the money in the economy. And we have the same problem now with the Juncker plan. The Juncker plan was then the, the last attempt from the new commission to launch something very innovative uh, also to come together with the, with the industry, with the private industry, 350 uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, it's very difficult to implement this, and this is a question of in which way the European uh, Union uh, is functioning. And there you have then immediately a trust problem, a trust problem which is coming up. I had once a conference in, uh, in Spain, it was in the 2012 or 2013, if I remember this very well, and a lot of people said to me, I can't trust anymore the politicians because the first thing they have done when they have to tackle the crisis is to cut our uh, social benefits, to cut our unemployment scheme. And this was uh, uh, also, a, a, it was in a tourist area and I spoke with the local mayor and he said, well, normally we had a, an unemployment scheme uh, for the, for the uh, uh, tourist season that over winter they were paid by the, 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 the social security system. This is now over, so people have no trust anymore uh, in the politicians. And that's why also uh, what, what you were saying so rightly, uh, to regain and to reinstall uh, trust has to be started also on the level of the political parties. And as long as, I, I know a bit on that because I'm working a lot with political parties, but as long, uh, very critical, and uh, probably some will, will hurt me then afterwards in the movement, but political parties are nowadays often still organized like 19th century uh, labor movements. And they are not organized in a sense that they are responding to that what is needed in the 21st century. And that's why also a lot of people don't have a voice in political parties. They don't feel uh, to go to a political party, to be engaged in, 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 in that what is a discussion, what is a debate. The voice is not, not, not listened and uh, uh, they not feel to be taken seriously what is their opinion, especially the young people. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Stefan, maybe you want to say something about the terrorists and yeah. point rest um, to yeah? But first, picking up yeah, on, yeah. on uh, what Ernst uh, just said, uh, and, and maybe complementing um, in that sense with, a, with an argument, these expectations um, have sped up uh, mm. dramatically, I think, uh, as a result of the internet generation, mm. uh, social media uh, generation, you know, the click generation perhaps, you know, expectations are here and now and they need to be addressed here and now, just like you open a web page and you book a flight and swift. 
Uh, political parties are not uh, organized that way. Of course, pol policy problems require, um, you know, a deeper understanding, deeper analysis, uh, compromise solutions. That all takes time. Um, but it, indeed, if then the wrong decision seems to be seem to be made, uh, it it it's, it looks as if politicians are not listening at all. So it does indeed um, lead to more, yeah. Uh, support for the fringe uh, parties in that sense. Added to that is the dynamic uh, that we've seen of uh, in, in the past, which is that of mainstream political parties essentially not talking or pushing away that what they call you know, populist or Eurosceptic or nationalist uh, voice, which is expressed through these protest uh, parties. That is not helpful. Um, so obviously, there should be uh, there should be a wider debate. Um, the 89ers should perhaps be given a, a bigger responsibility in those political parties too. Um, whether that would automatically result in a more progressive um, uh, stance, I I'm not so sure. I mean, there there is a movement, in fact, called the uh, 1989ers, which has been tackling you know, European questions and came up with rather conservative. Uh, answers, which suggest you know more support again for uh, for the mainstream or uh, for solutions which in fact are being propagated by uh, by those mainstream uh, parties. Um, I think as a result also of the Brexit, there will be a self-correcting mechanism somehow. Uh, people will realise um, what they may have uh, what they may have lost uh, in the process if indeed those political parties now finally follow up on their, uh, on their political will and cut that European level of governance which has been supposedly so uh, <coughs> oppressive uh, to them. They, they will come to realize that European solutions are necessary for trans-border challenges or to, to tap trans-border uh, opportunities. Uh, if the union didn't exist, you would have to invent it uh, in a way. So I think there will be a self-correcting uh, mechanism over time. These, these political trends seem to be uh, cyclical uh, in a way. It's, it's a matter of managing them properly. Now, as, a, as for um, uh, terrorism or, or homegrown uh, terrorists, there was an interesting study in, the wake, uh, in Belgium in the wake of the Brussels attacks, uh, which suggested that you know, this is not necessarily um, a problem of, uh, of uh, radicalized Islamists, uh, but rather of Islamized criminals, petty criminals who have no, uh, who see no opportunities because of uh, bad education, because of uh, uh, of glass ceilings in, in uh, being offered jobs, um, because of uh, the, the ghettoized communities they live in and the lack of, uh, of policing on, on the street and fomenting uh, more, uh, more criminality and, and unrest. Um, those are issues which primarily, socioeconomic, you know, but especially education, which lie yeah. at a national uh, yeah. level and need to be tackled there. Here, you know, uh, sharing best experiences or practices from elsewhere in Europe uh, would be beneficial, you know, not just for the Molenbeeks of this, uh, of Belgium, but, you know, of Molenbeek-type uh, communities throughout, uh, throughout the continent. Okay, and here thank the you. Euro European Union could help. I, I'm going to save yes. that, if you save it for a summary. But um, I'm just, we've just got time for a quick, a uh, couple more suggestions, observations. Comments, if there are any, from the floor before I ask our panelists to wrap up. Um, no, okay. Well, um, I'll go straight to you to um, concluding thoughts. Could I just ask you, um, you've just got a couple of minutes each, literally a couple of minutes, for some concluding thoughts on this. But um, first of all, um, within that, I, I might ask you to reflect then on, you know, on the discussion we've had here and in the, and, and in the what do you think the main challenges are to the EU? If, if you think that the EU is better, better together, nonetheless, I think we've, had quite a, we've heard quite a lot from the floor and in the discussions about the challenges to the EU um, at different levels and in different spheres. Uh, so may, maybe, you know, if you're going to assume that it is better together, where, where should the EU be doing? 
doing better? How must the EU now do better? You know, we're two weeks away from one of its largest economies voting to get out. We've all agreed this is a, a serious challenge, whether the Brexit vote happens or not. Um, so where are the main areas for improvement? What really must it be doing better now? So maybe we can start with I you. I suppose one of the challenges that has not been discussed at a great depth at this forum uh, is the question of, 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 of monetary policy in the Eurozone. Uh, and I'll say this at the risk of upsetting our German friends in the room. So if you, you, know, if you, if you take this as a microaggression, you should run away from the room screaming. Uh, uh, because indeed, I, I actually differ from, from, from Ernst on, on this issue of the importance of fiscal stimulus for American uh, recovery. The, the way I read the evidence, and obviously there are different ways of, 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 of looking at the studies that are out there, is, is that we know relatively little about the size of fiscal multipliers, about this, the effect that, uh, that the stimulus uh, going back to 2009 had on, uh, on America's economy going forward. But we do know that there is one huge difference between, uh, between, the, between the US economy in the post-crisis world and the European one. And that has to do with monetary policy. Uh, the Fed responded very quickly uh, with uh, a massive array of tools to counter uh, the decline in nominal spending. Uh, in, in, in the US economy. Uh, the quantitative easing was uh, deployed early on and was, 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 was large in scale. In the Eurozone, in contrast, uh, inflation was throughout the critical years well below target, uh, slipping into deflation on the Eurozone's periphery. And it took essentially until 2013, until the everything it takes speech for the ECB to start countering uh, this historically unprecedented collapse in nominal spending in the Eurozone. And it took another two years, essentially until last year, to, to scale the QE programs up to something that, that, was, that was meaningful. So I think one element of the problem which we are having is that uh, the Eurozone has been endowed, uh, perhaps from a, by, by a political bargain, uh, from its inception with, with a monetary policy that, that acts as a, as a strangulation mechanism uh, in times of crises, particularly for, for, the, for the peripheral countries. Um, so, so I see that as, as one component of the story that's very difficult to, 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 to change or modify, uh, but one that I think we should be aware of. Okay, and some concluding thoughts yes. from what you've heard? Uh, three points for yep. me. First, uh, reinstalling growth, social cohesion means fighting inequalities. This is the, the challenge of the European Union internally, but also uh, in, in a whole. Uh, secondly, uh, what comes out also a bit, I think, of the debates here, uh, getting more democratic, getting more closer to the people, having more kind of uh, uh, an ear what, what is going on uh, uh, in, in, in the societies. And let me perhaps bring in something, and I think this has a lot to do also with the common security. I think the European Union should go more global. Uh, we don't have uh, a feeling that, or we often have the feeling that we are much sticked on our own little nitty-gritty problems on the national levels, and we don't see what the world is doing so far and what the globalization is bringing as a challenges. And this is the real point of, of, of the European Union for getting better, finding the answers for the globalized world in the 21st century. Thank you, and Stefan. But to, to me, the, uh, the biggest challenge uh, that the European Union faces, uh, as indeed um, regional cooperation, as in indeed the national governance system, uh, systems face, is, uh, is what we've discussed, uh, a lack of trust and a lack of uh, solidarity um, to, uh, to cooperate. I think after the Brexit referendum, there will have to be a moment where it is community of law is reset on its political foundations. There will have to be a serious discussion about what this European Union means to us and what it's there for. I mean, almost in the, the classic Monty Python sense, you know, life of Brian, 
what, has, what have the Romans ever done for us? Mm -hmm. what, have the, what has the European Union ever done for us? There was a hapless campaign, PR campaign by the European Commission a, a few a years back, you know, with all kinds of, uh, okay, cheaper flights and, you know, you can move your, your, your capital uh, more freely across borders um, between banks uh, of several member states. That is part of the answer. Uh, much more deeper, I think, you know, is really that, that political uh, uh, value, that, that political context in which, you know, that community of law should be, uh, should be couched. And that is um, where we should be uh, focusing our attention uh, in the next half of the year, uh, as indeed in the um, important election year in France, Germany and other places uh, next year. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to our panel. I feel, I feel we've done, got at least halfway to solving all the EU's problems, <laughs> and I'll, I'll take them all back to Britain with me tomorrow, and, and um, we'll win the Remain vote as a consequence. So thank you very much to Dalibor, um, Ernst, and Seferin for a fascinating session. Thank you. Thanks a lot.